Hello, everyone. <coughs> I hope you all are well and happy. All right, let me watch it. Very happy. So the sutta today is the simile of the quail. Isn't that coincidence? Sometimes we have to go by coincidence. David opened up this book after thinking about the simile of the quail and opened it up to the simile of the quail. So that's what we're going to do today. Okay. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at the country of Anguttara Apana at a town of theirs named Apana. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Apana for alms. When he, went, when he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to a certain grove. What are you doing? Um. Your signal's not very strong. It said, it said stop video. Mm -hmm. What is that? No, that's okay. I just want to see what. Hang on just a second. We're figuring things out here. That's okay. Okay, I thought it picked up the wrong. No, it's on this. It's not strong. Okay, after his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. When it was morning, the venerable Udayan dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he too went into Apana for alms. When he'd wandered for alms in Apana, and had returned from his alms round. After his meal, he went to that same grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then, while a venerable Udayan was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Then when it was evening, the Venerable Udayan rose from his meditation and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? And how many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Venerable Sir, formerly we used to eat in the evening, in the morning, and during the day, outside the proper time. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that daytime meal outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking faithful householders give us food of various kinds during the day outside the proper time. Yet the Blessed One tells us to abandon it. The sublime ones tell us to relinquish it. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that daytime meal outside the proper time. Outside the proper time is 
the afternoon. Okay, we can have food up to high noon. Right now, where I am, high noon is about one o'clock. But when the time changes, it's going to be 12 o'clock. So I have to eat before 12. <clears throat> then we ate only in, uh, in the evening and in the morning. There was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that night, that night meal which is outside the proper time. So when we eat food, we can eat from when the, when the sun comes up, <clears throat> which is around 5.30 to 6 o'clock, until high noon. And we can have as many meals as we want in that period of time. Some monasteries because they have a lot of young monks there, they, they let them eat right before they go out on alms round. And then they go out on alms round, eat another meal when they get back, and then they eat a meal at around 11 o'clock. So they have three meals in the day, but it's jammed into a six hour period. I personally eat one meal a day because I'm comfortable with that. And I stay healthy because of that. One of the things that's real important to understand, as a monk, there are only a few things that I can have outside the proper time. I can have jaggery, I can have oil, um, I can have honey, I can have sugar. Um, things like that. But, oh, I can have salt. That's another thing. But the, the sugar and salt both are for health reasons, which is really odd to think. But if we have any open wounds, if we put sugar on the open wound, it'll stop it from bleeding. And that's what they used to use when they were fighting in uh, the olden times, when they were using swords and arrows and things like that. They would use sugar and put on the wound, and that would help heal the wound. So we consider it a medicine. Unfortunately, these days, an awful lot of monks eat candy and wind up with diabetes. And it's, it's starting to be pretty rampant among monks. I don't have that problem. So don't worry about it. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad thinking the Blessed One tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of our two meals. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Once, Venerable Sir, a certain man had obtained some soup during the day and said, put that aside and we will all eat it together in the evening. Nearly all cooking is done at night, little by day. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that nighttime meal, which was outside the proper time. It has happened, venerable sir, that monks wandering for alms in the thick darkness of the night have walked into cesspits, fallen into sewers, walked into thorn bushes, and fallen over sleeping cows. That would be a shock. 
they have met hoodlums who had already committed a crime and who's planning one and they have been sexually enticed by women once venerable sir i went wam wandering for alms in the thick thick darkness of night a woman washing a pot outside saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed in terror mercy me the devil has come before us i told her sister i'm not the devil i am a monk waiting for alms then it's a monk whose ma's died or whose paws died better monk that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for alms for your belly's sake in the darkness of night one of the things i notice from being a monk is very seldom i go out at night or if i'm going out at night i'm only going to another monastery to give a talk or a, a person's house for a special kind of blessing. And I've come to the conclusion when, when the sun goes down, people start to go a little bit crazy and they do all kinds of things that they wouldn't normally do during the daytime. So I've, I've concluded that it's a lot safer for me not to go out at night. Uh, people like to drink alcohol and then drive and then they wind up in an accident. It could happen to me in, inside of somebody else's car. So I, I don't generally go out at night. That's the time to sit um, and generally follow the Dhamma rules. Venerable sir, when I recollected that thought, how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? And how many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? So too, Dian, there are certain misguided men here who, when, I, when told by me, abandoned this, say, what? Such a trivial, such a, a little thing this is. This recluse is much too exacting and they do not abandon that and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards the monks desiring for this kind of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether and a thick yoke Suppose, Udayan, a quail were tethered by a rotting creeping, uh, creeper and would thereby expect injury, captivity, or death. Now, suppose someone said that rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered and thereby expecting injury, captivity, or death is for her feeble, weak, rotting, cordless tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, for the quail, the rotting creeper by which it is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death, is a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether, a thick yoke. So too, Diane, there are certain misguided men 
here who, when, when told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that. And they showed discourtesy towards me as well as towards other monks desirous of training. For that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, unrotting uh, tether, a, a thick yoke. Udayan, there are some clansmen here. When told by me, abandon this. Say, what's such a trifle, such a little thing to be abandoned as this? The Blessed One tells us to abandon. The sublime tells us to relinquish. Yet they abandon that and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards the monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mind aloof as a wild deer's. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, cordless tether. Suppose Udayan, a royal tusker elephant, with tusks as long as a chariot pole, full in growth and stature, high-bred, and accustomed to battle, were the tether by a strong leather thongs, but it simply twisting his body a little could break and burst that thong and then go where he likes. Now suppose someone said that stout leather thong by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered for him a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether, a thick yoke, would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, the stout leather thongs by which that royal tusker is tethered, which by simply twisting his body a little could break it and burst it and then go where he wants. For him, that that is a feeble, weak, rotting, ted, ted, cordless tether. So to Udayan, there are certain clansmen here, when told by me, abandon this, abandon that, and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards others, other monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mind aloof as a wild deer's. What we're actually talking about here is following the rules. And when you follow the rules, you don't have ever have a... Um, Um, a mind that is full of regret doing something that you know that you shouldn't and it affects you in a negative way in your practice. I'll give you an example. I was in Burma and a monk who was a Mahayana monk came to that center and when he came he could sit for three hours without moving which was pretty impressive. But he wanted to become a Theravada monk. So he took off his Mahayana robes and started wearing the Theravada robes and became a Theravada monk. Now he knew that one of the rules is you don't eat after high noon. But he disregarded that and he started feeling guilty because he knew he was breaking a rule. 
Mahayana monks, they say, oh, it doesn't matter. You can eat an evening meal and we'll call it uh, some kind of medicine. And they, every night they eat an evening meal. But the Theravada, we don't do that. After being there for three months, because he knew he was breaking a rule, he could not sit more than 10 minutes before restlessness overtook him and he had to get up and walk around. So he went from being a good monk and sitting for long with the meditation to being a monk that broke the rules and it affected him and caused him to be very restless and he didn't gain anything from being at that monastery for three months. He was continually talking with other people, entertaining himself in whatever way he could because he was so restless. Now, while he was doing that, I was following the rules. And I went from sitting for an hour to sitting for between six and eight hours without moving. Why could I do that? Because I didn't feel guilty. I didn't have restlessness attacking me all the time. Now, the thing with that I'm, I'm telling you is keeping your precepts without breaking them. One of the advantages of following the precepts without breaking them is your mind tends to become collected very quickly. Your mind settles down with your daily activities, your mindfulness is sharp and you are tempted to break one of the precepts, but you notice that desire before it turns into action. And then you can say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Even with little white lies. Now, I've had students that have been practicing a long time and they would get done with a meditation retreat that really wasn't very good progress. And they would tell me, now I can go back to being the way I was. In other words, breaking precepts and doing that sort of thing. Every time they would come to do another retreat, the first 10 days of the retreat, they had a lot of restlessness and they had to use the six R's a lot. And they had to put up with a lot of extra pains in their mind and in their body. After about 10 days, then their mind would be pure enough, be clean enough without having a guilty feeling or a guilty mind from breaking the precepts. They, then they started progressing in the meditation and they had one or two days of good meditation. And then they had to go home because I don't teach long retreats. Uh, <clears throat> some had been had do, been doing this for many many retreats and they kept on hearing me say over and over you need to follow the precepts don't break the precepts if you keep your precepts it turns into a protection for you and you become more mindful with your daily activities now that's what the Buddha is talking about here. 
if you break one of the precepts, you are going to feel guilty. Your mind is going to say sometimes very quietly, I shouldn't have done that. But then you kind of shine it on and forget about it. But it always comes back to haunt you. It always comes back to cause your meditation retreat to be very slow progress because you have to purify your mind with the six R's and letting go of craving. Now, what is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it. It's the false belief, it's the beginning of the false belief in the personal self. So that's unwholesome. And if you want to develop a wholesome mind quickly, then you have to keep your precepts all the time. Now, you're going to have a lot of benefits from keeping your precepts without breaking them. And that is you're going to have a more and more clear mind, especially in a, an emergency situation. You're going to know the right thing to do at the right time. Sometimes I, I'll, I'll see a, a car accident. I stop on the side of the road. I get the people that are driving me to stop. And we start radiating loving kindness to everyone in that's involved with the accident. They go from being very unorganized and actually not very helpful because they're running around wondering what they should be doing instead of doing things that are necessary at the time. I'll give you another example. Um, I had a student that her sister was not very good at following precepts and they gossiped and they did it. They were never being honest with the things that they were saying. One of the kids that was at the table with them, they swallowed an olive, got stuck in the throat and couldn't breathe. Now, the sister that was there that broke the precepts, she started yelling, help, 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 help. And she ran outside and she was running down the street yelling for help. And my student got the olive out. Now, that's the difference between keeping a precept and breaking a precept. And I personally have had a time when I fell off a roof and I broke my wrist. The closest person to me was one of the helpers that didn't follow precepts at all. Now I'm lying on the ground and I'm holding my wrist and he comes up and he says, are you all right? I said, I think I broke my wrist. And what he did was grab my hand and do this to my wrist that was broken. And I told him in no uncertain terms that he better go away and leave me alone. But that's the difference between somebody that know that keeps their precepts. They stay in the present. They don't get rattled and do the wrong thing at the wrong time. So that's one of the ways that the precepts are a protection for you. Because in a tense situation, your mind becomes 
more mindful, more clear. Uh, another example, I was at one time when I was a layman, I was a, a waiter. And this is when they still had ashtrays and there was smoking in the, the uh, restaurant. And somebody put a cigarette and didn't tamp it out all the way. And then somebody came along and took the ashtray and threw it in a pile of papers. And right, right as that happened, I was on the other side of the room and there started to be a lot of smoke coming from the trash can. And two people standing right beside it started yelling, fire, 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 and they didn't do anything. And I'm on the other side of the room and I look up and I see the smoke coming up and I say, yeah, that could be a fire. And I calmly walked over, took a pitcher of water and put the fire out. That's the difference between following the precepts and not following the precepts. Your mind becomes overexcited and you don't do the right thing at the right time. Now, when I first started meditating back in the 70s, when meditation, especially Vipassana, was starting to get popular, the teachers at that time, they didn't like the idea of, quote, morality. So they didn't teach it as part of the Buddha's path. And that's been a mistake for a long, long time. The Buddha's path is about purifying your mind. And how do you purify your mind? You purify your mind by being able to recognize when a hindrance arises. You let it be. Now, one of the meditation practices is you note this hindrance until it goes away and then you come back to your object of meditation, which was the breath. But that's wrong effort. According to the Buddha's teaching, right effort, there's four different parts. First, you recognize that there's a hindrance. Next, you release the hindrance. You don't keep your attention on it and relax. Next, bring up something wholesome. Smile and bring that relaxed, pure mind back to your object of meditation and stay on your object of meditation for as long as you can. Now, if you don't have this relaxed step, there are major problems for you. You can develop good concentration but the kind of concentration that you develop is leading you away from the Buddha's path. And I'll show you why. Your mind is on your object of meditation. There's a distraction that occurs. When you're practicing noting, stay with that distraction until it goes away and then immediately come back to your object of meditation, you're bringing the craving back to your object of meditation. And that causes mind to develop a different kind of hindrance, a different kind of path that does not purify your mind because you're bringing the craving back to your object of meditation. 
Now, when you practice the twim that I'm teaching, your mind is on your object of meditation, gets distracted. Release the distraction. Don't keep your attention on that distraction. Don't make the distraction any kind of a big deal. Relax. And that means letting go of craving. The way you recognize craving when it arises is the tension and tightness caused in your head, in your mind. And I've explained this many times over. You have your mind, your, your brain is like this, is two lobes. And there is a membrane that goes around this. It's called the meninges. It's like a bag. Every time you have a thought, a distracting thought, every time there's a distracting feeling, every time there's a sensation, your brain expands out against that, tent, that meninges and there's tension and tightness there. And that is how you recognize craving. See, I spent 12 years in Asia trying to find out some simple answers. I wanted to know what craving was, and I never got a true answer. And I didn't find out the answer until I came to the suttas and started reading just the suttas without commentaries. And when you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, it says very plainly, you train thus. I shall tranquilize the bodily formation on the in-breath. I shall tranquilize the bodily formation on the out-breath. So this changes the entire focus of the meditation. When you're practicing mindfulness of breathing with other techniques, they tell you to focus on the breath and see the beginning and the middle and the end of the in-breath and the space in between and the middle and or the beginning and middle and end of the in-breath. In and you do the same with the out-breath. Now what that's teaching you is to one-pointedly observe just the breath. With what I'm teaching you, You're using the breath as the reminder to let go of craving. On the in-breath, you relax. On the out-breath, you relax. A distraction comes. You allow the distraction to be there. You release that distraction. Don't keep your attention on it and then you relax. Then you bring up wholesome, smile, lighten your mind. When you don't have these two steps, the relax and the bringing up the wholesome, making your mind light, you're putting in too much energy and you cause yourself to get headaches. You're causing yourself to suffer. So it's real important that you use the release, relax, smile, object of meditation. Stay with your object as long as you want. That is right effort. Now, an awful lot of people 
They talk about the Four Noble Truths, but they talk about it in a surface way. The Four Noble, noble Truths are incredibly deep. And the path leading to the cessation of suffering is right effort. In other words, the six R's. And the six R's will take you all the way to arahatship. Many students I have who start following this and they're really sincere in their practice, their progress in the meditation is fast. And quite often in a 10 day retreat, at least half of the students are successful because they follow the directions the way they're given. Now, a lot of people that have been doing meditation for years and years, they want to throw in something that worked with another meditation. And that doesn't work. You can't add anything or subtract anything to the path leading to the cessation of suffering. You have to follow that path by itself. Then you have the potential to be successful with your meditation. I have many students that are Sotapanna, Saktagamis, and Anagamis. Why? Because they follow the directions without adding anything or subtracting anything. And it's not my instruction. I want you to get clear with that. This is what the Buddha is teaching in the suttas. Right? Effort is necessary. And it's necessary for you to understand what right effort is. And that's what I've been talking about the whole time. Now, if you're practicing, um, let's say the Vipassana, mindfulness of breathing, and you put your attention on your nose or your upper lip or your abdomen, that is going away from the instructions of the Buddha. He doesn't give those kind of instructions. He doesn't give you any physical place to put, keep your attention on. He just says, on the in-breath, relax. On the out-breath, relax. Tranquilize the bodily formation is what he actually says. But that comes down to relax. When you relax, look at what happens right after that. Your mind is clear. Your mind is bright. You don't have distracting thoughts. And you have let go of a hindrance. So there's a lot of benefit in practicing in this way. The closer you can stay with having a light mind, now, every time I give a retreat, one of the first things I tell everyone, which kind of goes against the grain of most, most meditation practices, smile. You smile with your mind, you smile with your eyes, even though your eyes are closed. You have tension there. As soon as you smile with your eyes, it becomes softer. 
a little Buddha smile on your lips and a smile in your heart. So a smile is not just the big uh, toothy grin all the time. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. Now the thing with smiling and the improving of the mindfulness is a lot of people don't understand the definition of mindfulness. It's like that's a word that you're naturally supposed to understand, so I'm not going to tell you any more about it. And people wind up talking about mindfulness in all kinds of peculiar ways. But I'm going to give you the definition of mindfulness that works 100% of the time and makes you go deeper in your meditation. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How does that happen? We don't care about emotional upsets. That's on down the road with the links of dependent origination. When you relax, your mind is clear, very observant, and your mind is pure. Why? Because you have let go of craving. That was a major discovery that I had. Now, I had practiced straight Vipassana for 20 years. I was very successful. I knew all of the insight knowledges from direct experience. But I wasn't satisfied with the end result. For that 20 years, my mind had become more and more critical. And I, I would get just as angry as I ever did when I first started. After 20 years of practice, you would think, well, it's not supposed to be like that. I was just as highly em emotional as I was when I first started. There was something that wasn't right with that practice and I didn't know what it was. So I just stopped it altogether. And I went to the suttas, but I was reading the suttas and comparing what the sutta said to what the Visuddhi Magga said, because that's supposed to be the dictionary for meditation, right? Well, I had a monk friend come and he said, I understand you're teaching meditation. And I told him, yes. And he said, and I was teaching loving kindness at the time. And he said, well, tell me how you're teaching it. And after I got into it a bit, he said, you know, you're teaching it correctly, but you're using the language of the Visuddhimagga. Why don't you let go of the Visuddhimagga and just go to the suttas? Now, I had read the suttas a lot, but I always was comparing it to the Visuddhimagga and they didn't match. So when I had somebody tell me to put the Visuddhi Magga aside and just read the suttas, all of a sudden I could understand what the suttas were talking about. And I had light bulbs going off in my head all over the place because I, I read 
the Satipatthana Sutta, but I was always clouded by the Visuddhimagga rather than just reading the sutta itself. And as soon as I started reading the sutta itself, I started really understanding more and more clearly how this whole process works. One of the problems that people have with the straight vipassana is they don't recognize hindrances as clearly as they need to be recognized. And they don't know how to let go of those hindrances. They don't know how to purify their mind. They don't even understand what craving actually is. Well, craving is desire. Well, there's more to it than that. Craving causes tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. And that's how you recognize when craving is there. Now, if you want to get into a jhana, which was a forbidden thing to talk about when I was practicing straight vipassana. Oh, stay away from the jhana. That's only for psychic abilities. That's what I was told. Well, I have since run across some definitions of jhana that is quite different than what I had ever known before. And I've taken these as uh, closer to the Buddha's teaching than anything else. Jhanas are levels of understanding. Okay. So you go to the first jhana, you're going to experience one kind of understanding and how to get there. And you, you, don't have hindrances coming up and pulling your attention away. When you're in a jhana, your mind is what the Buddha calls the super mundane state. Okay. So you have super knowledge when you are in the sutta because you don't have any hindrances directing your mind attention away. And your mind has to be pure because no hindrances are in your mind at that time. And then you go to the second jhana. That's a different level of your understanding. And you start having a lot more confidence in your practice because you see, yeah, this really does work. When I first came back to the United States after being in Asia for 12 years, I wanted to start calling this the oh wow meditation. Because you have oh wows all the time, you're understanding. You are teaching yourself how to progress in the meditation. You are your own teacher. I'm a guide. I'm not a teacher. If you're on the path, I'll, I'll encourage you to stay on the path. If you start getting off the path a little bit, I'm going to encourage you to come back and get on the path. That's my job. But you're teaching yourself. And you're teaching yourself how to recognize hindrances when they arise, when they pull your attention away from your object of meditation. You're no longer in the jhana when you have the hindrance arise. Now you have to use the six Rs and then purify your mind and get back into the jhana. 
And it's like every one of the jhanas is a different kind of meditation. It's not exactly the same, although you're using the same method to let go of distractions. You're still using the six R's, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Now, I, I, I only give 10-day retreats because you don't need any longer than that. Isn't that amazing to hear? In 10 days in a retreat, you will learn more about Buddhism because of your direct experience than you ever have learned before. This is why I read the suttas, and I read them to you every night, and you're understanding how this process works, starts to grow. And like I said, in a 10-day retreat, I have quite a few students that are able to experience Nibbana. And I'm not saying this, puffing up my chest and saying, look at how good I am. I'm not doing it. You're doing it. You should be understanding how this process works. Mine can be real sneaky with its distractions and such. But as you use the six R's, when I first start, uh, I was talking before about telling everybody at the start of the retreat, I want you to smile. I want you to laugh. I want you to have fun. Now, if you go into a lot of different retreats, you walk in and you see everybody and they have this real stern look on their face and deep lines in between their eyes. And they're trying really hard. Well, your progress is incredibly slow. Why? Because you're putting too much effort into it. You have to learn to lighten your mind. Not get over serious with it. And when you were in school and you had a class that you really liked, what kind of grade did you get in that class? Good grades. Why? Because it was fun for you. And the more fun you have with the meditation, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. So, what to do? Stop trying so hard. One of the biggest problems I have with people that have been doing meditation for a long time and come to me is for me to get you to lighten up, have fun, smile more, laugh at how crazy your mind can get, because it'll come up with all kinds of nonsense. And mind by nature is crazy. And it's okay to be crazy. Just don't take it personally. Laugh with it. Now, why, why would I say to laugh? Meditation is supposed to be serious, right? But when you laugh at yourself, let's say for being angry, and you see that you're angry and you kind of chuckle and go, boy, I'm really going off the deep end here. As soon as you laugh, you go from I am angry to it's only this anger. Now, what did you just do? You just let go of craving. So when you laughed, 
Now it's part of an impersonal process. Do I want to walk around with this angry feeling all day? I'm not that crazy. Let it go. Now that's the truth of the Dhamma. The thing that you have to truly understand is the lighter and more fun you have with the meditation, the easier it is to see when your mind starts to get heavy and gets caught up in the mud. And when you recognize that, then you use the six R's and you let go of that craving and you smile a little, little bit for getting caught and come back to your object of meditation with an uplifted mind. Now there's supposed to be a lot of joy in the meditation itself. And what I was told continually, anytime I had joy when I was practicing straight vipassana, I had my teachers say, don't get attached. Well, you don't have to be attached to joy. You allow it to be there as long as it's going to be there. You don't even keep your attention on it. If you put your attention on it and stay with the joy, then you are attached. You're taking it personally. But the joy will come up. Your mind will get much lighter. And with that lighter mind, your observation power becomes stronger. And you start seeing when you first start getting caught. Now this is the advantage of keeping your precepts because you'll notice this more quickly and you'll be able to let it be and relax and smile and come back to your object of meditation more easily. Now, I've had some students that go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they ask me, how can I be more wealthy? I want, to, I want to be rich. Being rich is easy. And the first thing I tell them is you have to practice your generosity. Now, people think generosity means, well, you got to give to the monks. No, generosity means being kind to other people and helping them overcome their suffering. You're giving away your loving kindness. You're giving away your compassion and helping other people to overcome their suffering. That's generosity. It's not just about giving food or giving material things. Generosity is helping other people to smile. Helping other people to let go of the suffering. And that's what the Sangha community is supposed to be all about. Any of your friends that's suffering, do things to make them smile, things to make them laugh, do things that help uplift their mind. Sometimes it's not saying anything, it's just radiating compassion or radiating loving kindness <clears throat> to that person and their situation and their family. If you want to affect the world around you in a positive way, then radiate loving kindness to the world. You want to affect everybody around you in a nice way, love them, because that's what they're looking for. Everybody is looking for love and to be accepted and to be happy. So help them. That's generosity. 
The second thing that I told this person that he wanted to be rich, I told him, okay, that's the first step. Now, the second step is taking the five precepts and keeping them without breaking them at all. Anytime you break a hindrance, you feel guilty. You might just shrug it off and say, ah, that was, that was nothing. That was just a little thing. But no, it's a big thing. And he finally said, okay, okay, I'll do that. How long do I have to do that? How long do I have to keep my precepts? I said, well, we'll start at 100 years and go up from there. Keep your precepts and you will see major benefits starting to occur. Your wholesome, uplifted mind allows other it's almost magical things to occur, like what happened with David today. He was thinking about this sutta on the quail. He opened up the book, and there was a sutta of the quail. And he had, he had, a, he had a good laugh with that. How much fun is that? And sometimes you'll start saying things that other people are thinking, and they'll go, can you read my mind? And no, I don't read minds. I get accused of it all the time, but I don't do it on purpose. I don't know I'm doing it. I'm not reading your mind. I'm saying what's coming out. And it happens to be what you were thinking. I don't know how that happens. It doesn't happen all the time, and it's certainly not me that's doing it. But as your mind gets more and more pure, more and more uplifted, you become more and more sensitive. Now, when the Buddha is talking about getting into jhanas and some of the experiences you can have while you're in the jhana, you can start developing what's called the divine eye. And you can also start developing what's called the divine ear. The divine eye, what it basically means is you'll be able to see beings in other realms. I have students that do that. And they hear beings in other realms. So they can go visit one of the heavenly realms and hang out and talk with the, the devas that are there or brahmins that are there. Almost everybody has that ability as you quiet your mind down and become more pure, keeping your precepts without breaking them, this will develop by itself. And I've, I have some students that told me they could do that. And I said, okay, now I'm halfway around the world I want you to visit my mother's house. I told her what, it was in California. It was in a, a town called Escondido. I said, I want you to see the street that she lives on and I wanna see the ad, if you can see the address. And she directed her mind to be able to do that. And she did it. She lived on 8th Avenue, and it was 837 was the number of the house. And she saw my, my mother standing in the doorway, in, in the open door. And she told me, and I said, what color uh, clothes did she have on? Well, my mother that day had blue clothes. 
and she it was a nice dress and she was getting ready to go somewhere so she said that she's wearing blue so i called up my mother right then and i asked her what color clothes do you have on right now and she said blue i said great thanks mom and then i hung up and started talking to this other lady she was able to see with the divine eye all she had to do was point her mind in the direction she wanted it to go she would see devas and because she had the divine ear she could talk to them uh, she was chinese and uh, malay so she was her first language was chinese and i said what language did you talk to the devas in was it english and i said no it was chinese It doesn't matter what language you, you speak to, the devas will be able to communicate with you. They can tell you all kinds of fun things and interesting things. You can develop seeing past lifetimes but I won't teach you that until you get to a certain level in your meditation because you have to have strong equanimity. We've all done things that are kind of scary and not so nice in the past. And if you don't have that equanimity, then it's, it's gonna be a, a terrible experience for you. So these things are possible through the meditation. And it all starts with the six R's. When you talk about the Eightfold Path, the first that they talk about is, they call it right view and I don't like that definition very much, so I call it harmonious perspective. And the harmonious perspective is always what occurs right after you let go and relax, let go of the craving. You have a harmonious perspective. That means that you're not taking anything personally you're seeing the impersonal nature of everything. Craving causes you to have the wrong view. And the wrong view is taking things personally. And the reason you take things personally be, is because in the past you broke a precept and you feel ashamed or uh, guilty for breaking that precept. And the way you let go of it is by practicing right view, is by practicing the six R's. <laughs> 